This morning we're um, in Mark's Gospel again. We're going to be looking at chapter 9 in verses 14 through 29. Again, I believe Greg has already uh, previewed for us a little bit of what the passage is about. The man with the demon-possessed son that uh, the disciples aren't able to cast him out, the, the demon that is, but uh, find that uh, Jesus is, and the, the reason they weren't able to was the fact that they did not believe, and they did not appropriate um, additional help from the Lord through prayer. Prayer is one of the ways that the Lord strengthens our faith. So let's begin by uh, reading verses 14 through 29, Mark chapter 9. And when they came back uh, to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? One of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and stiffens out. And I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling about and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and began saying, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the, became, the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. And when he had come into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now you recall that uh, last time we were in the Gospel of Mark, we saw something of the price that the Lord calls us to pay if we are to follow him. And he did it by way of example. Uh, first of all, his own example. Uh, Jesus set an example for us to follow of self-sacrifice and of service uh, that he was willing to do, uh, whatever it is the Father called him to do, that he was willing to pay whatever price he had to pay to serve the Father. And you know from the scriptures that Jesus did pay the ultimate price. Uh, Jesus gave up his life. He laid his life down on the cross, willingly sacrificed himself so that he might redeem as many as would believe in him back to God, away from their sins and, of course, their indebtedness to his justice. Now, the scripture says that if you would, would know the Lord in, in a saving relationship, if you would know Jesus, the way he calls you to know him, which, of course, is more than just reading the Bible and um, uh, believing the facts, uh, the Bible does, of course, you do have to read it. And you do need to believe these things. But the Bible does say that believing the facts is not going to save you unless you actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Then he will. You must actually rely upon him. But again, in trusting Jesus, the Bible also says there is something you must do. That is, turn from your sins and follow him. What we saw in the text before, in the example of Jesus, is what he was willing to do in order to save us. We need to follow that example. If we are actually to arrive in heaven, we need to follow him. Paul was one in Philippians chapter 3 who, who uh, basically expresses his whole heart, his whole desire. 
and that was to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He wanted to know the power of God in his life, but he realized in order to do that, he had to suffer. And that's what happens when you follow Jesus. That's what happened to Jesus as he was following his father's will. He did suffer and he did die. So we need to follow Jesus. This is the way that leads to eternal life. You need to follow him. I need to follow him. We need to walk the path that he walked. Now we also saw that that is what John the Baptist did. John was actually following Jesus even though he came before Jesus in a certain sense. He was the one that God sent before his son in order to prepare the way, in order to herald the way. And like his Lord who would come after him, he also put aside his own desires to do what the Lord had called him to do. He gave up a comfortable life. He gave up at least as much of a plush life as you could have in first century Judaism. And he went out into the wilderness, laid down his life. He went out and when it was time, he preached repentance to the people and told them they needed to turn from their sins and receive the one who was coming after him. In other words, he was willing to follow Jesus. And as you know, he paid the ultimate price for it as well. He died for what the Lord had called him to do. He was literally willing to lay down his life. Now, that is what the Lord says you must be willing to do, too, if you are to follow him. You must be willing to pay this price in order to know him and that you might know him as he really is. Now, don't forget that the Lord doesn't call everyone literally to die, although many Christians have died in his service because they loved him and because that's what he called them to do. But even if he did, call you to die, and even if you do give up your life in this world, what is it that you have to gain? Well, we saw that too in what uh, the Lord said about himself, that he laid his life down in order that he may gain it back because the Father would raise him from the dead. There is the promise of the reward. If you lay your life down to follow Jesus, not only will you know him, know God in an intimate and saving way in this life, but you will also be a part of the resurrection, the resurrection to life that comes at the end of this world. You will gain eternal life. And I hope you see that that's worth any price that you would have to pay. Now, that's certainly the greatest blessing that you gain by following the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Remember, everyone's going to be raised, but some are going to be raised to life and some are going to be raised to judgment. It depends on whether or not you're trusting in Jesus Christ. If you trust him, you'll be raised to eternal life. If you do not trust him, then you will suffer for your sins for all eternity. But the Lord offers life to all who will trust him. So that is one uh, very great blessing and reward for trusting in Jesus. But this morning we see another very special blessing that God promises to give you if you will follow him. He will give you whatever you ask. Now I realize that that could be a loaded statement and some people, many people, even professing Christians have taken it the wrong direction and think that by this the Lord means they can ask for whatever their, their lustful heart desires and God's going to give it to them. No, God won't give you things that will destroy you, but he will give you things that you need. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Now Mark tells us that a man brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus. We know that Jesus had not yet returned from the mount, and so the man takes his son to the disciples and he tells them, you cast this demon out, but they weren't able to do it. Now, when Jesus arrives, he sees his disciples, I believe, arguing with some scribes. The scribes were probably looking at the disciples' inability to do what the man had asked, and they were blaming Jesus. I mean, they blamed Jesus for everything that went wrong because they didn't love him, because their hearts were like, basically like that of the demon uh, that wanted to do away with Jesus, and eventually they did. But they were blaming Jesus for the disciples' failure to cast this demon out. 
Now, Jesus asked them what they were talking about. The father explained what the demon had done to his son and what he was continuing to do and how he had brought him to the disciples, but they hadn't been able to help. So Jesus said, bring the boy to me. When the demon saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. Of course, Jesus asked the, the, the boy's father how long he had been in that condition. And the man said, from childhood, the demon had often thrown him into the fire and into the water. Now, I just wanted to pause here for a moment because this really could be a sermon in and of itself. But let me just mention this because I think it goes along very well with what um, Greg was speaking to the youth about last night, even though, again, I wasn't thinking about that when I prepared this so much, but it's just obvious here. I mean, look at what the demon was trying to do to this boy. When you throw somebody into the fire, you're not trying to enhance their life or into the water. The demon was trying to destroy this boy, and the only reason why he wasn't able to do it, and the only reason why he doesn't destroy any one of us, or the, you know, the demon or the devils, why they don't destroy any one of us at any time is because the Lord will not allow it. But again, notice his goal to destroy this child. Let me just bring out this one point. The devil wants to destroy you. That's why the Lord warns you about the devil. It says he, he you know, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's why the Lord warns you uh, against the things that are in this world, not the things that God created which are good, but those things which Satan has propagated in this world, the things that are constantly tempting us, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, the reason why the Lord warns us against those things is because they will destroy us. That's why Satan promotes these things in the world. Why the Lord warns us against these things like wanting too much money, wanting too much fame, too much glory, too much honor. Why he warns us against drugs, against sensual desires, against hatred and revenge. Sin is destructive. Sin will ruin you. And that's why the Lord says you need to steer clear of the world and not listen basically to your heart. You know how the world basically says follow your heart? If you want it, uh, go for it. Well, the problem is those wants inside of our heart are sinful. And the things that they want most like or most often are the things that will actually destroy us. You get too much of those things and really any of it can destroy you. Even the good things that God made can destroy you. I mean, food is good, but the Lord says if you eat too much of it, it can kill you. It's a sin to be uh, gluttonous. Uh, the Lord actually created wine to be good, but you get too much of it and you get drunk, and drunkenness is a sin. Even good things can be abused. But that's exactly what sin does. That's what the world wants you to do, and it's because that's what Satan wants. He wants to destroy you even as one of his demons was trying to destroy this boy. So this was the condition the boy was in. But now we get to the center of the matter in our text, or at least the burden of the message this morning. The disciples couldn't help this young man. And so the father cries out to Jesus, If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Now you know Jesus was not one to waste words and as is usually the case, he goes right to the heart of the issue. The problem that this boy's father was having and the problem that his disciples were also having could be summarized by that one word that the father used, the word if. Jesus asks this question, if you can, I mean, the, the man said, if you can do anything, help us. Jesus says, if you can, if you can is is basically the word of, of unbelief, of not trusting, not believing that he's able to do it. Faith says, I know you can, Jesus, please heal him. Now, isn't this a problem that we all have as believers? Is that we often use the word if, or we doubt that the Lord is able or willing to do what he, as a matter of fact, promises in his word that he will do. 
Now, what does Jesus say following that? He says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, the father was just being honest with himself and with Jesus, and he said this, I do believe. I believe that you're able to do this, Lord, but my faith isn't strong. So he adds, help my unbelief. And that's certainly something we need to learn to do. You realize when he said, help my unbelief, what he was doing was he was praying. When Peter was sinking in the water as he walked out to where Jesus was, when Jesus was walking on the water and he begins to sink and he says, Lord, help me, that's a prayer. That's speaking to the Lord. That's what's going on here. He prays and asks the Lord to help him, to give him faith so that his boy can be healed. Now, by this time, a crowd was beginning to gather, and so Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, and he left, but not without tearing the boy one more time. The boy looked like he was dead, but Jesus took him up and uh, took him by the hand and helped him up. Now, the disciples apparently still didn't get the point, and they were wondering, why could we not cast this demon out? And so when they came into the house, they asked Jesus, and Jesus said, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. I think you know in a parallel passage it also says fasting. So actually the disciples had two problems. They had unbelief. They didn't believe that God was able to do this or that the authority that Jesus had given to them earlier was sufficient. And they also didn't realize what they were supposed to do when they had a lack of faith. That is, pray and ask God for more. That's what prayer is for. It's a means to get God's help. Now, if you want the Lord's help in the things that he calls you to do for him, you need to realize that he has pledged to give you a great deal of help. But you have to believe. You have to believe that he will help you. And you have to pray and ask for more faith or pray and ask for more help. If you do, then Jesus says, everything will become possible for you, at least within certain boundaries. Now, let's consider two things this morning. First of all, that all things are possible for you as believers. But secondly, there is something that you need to do. You need to believe God. You need to trust him. So first of all, all things are possible for you. What does Jesus mean by all things? And here's where we have to be a little bit careful because there are those who take this passage and in their sinful hearts want to run with it in whatever direction they may want to run. They think that this means that whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you lust for, God is going to give it to you. If you want to be rich, all you have to do is ask God. Well, most people say, at least the... Um, Folks we see on television, give me all you have first and then God will give you more, you see. I think there's a little bit of an ulterior motive there. Okay. God is able to give whether you give to him or not, although God does promise in his word that if you're faithful in your giving that God will give back to you and that's a promise that you need to remember. But God doesn't want you to give so that you can become rich because that's a lust that could destroy you. Do you want to become famous, they say. Well, just ask God for fame. I remember a friend of mine that um, was wanting to apply this. He believed this to be the case, and I believe the man was sincere. But he said, I'm looking for a business that I could start because I know God wants to bless me. I just need to give him the opportunity to do it. Now, there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of falsity to that because God doesn't just stand around waiting to serve you. That's what a lot of people seem to think, that God is there just to make you happy. God is there to complete your life. God is there to fulfill your desires. You know, if I can just believe or find the right words to say, it's like I can pull God's arm like a one-armed bandit. He's going to pay off for me. That's not what the Bible says. Now, it's not that God doesn't want to make you happy. I mean, God does want you to be happy if you are willing to do certain things, if you are willing to go a particular direction. Now, he knows that you're only going to be happy if you go one particular direction. And that direction is not satisfying your lusts. 
As I mentioned before, you saw what the demon was trying to do to the, to the young boy. He was trying to destroy him. And that's exactly what many of the things in this world that people want will do to them. It will destroy them. Have you ever read the biographies of the rich and the famous? Have you read about their broken marriages? Have you read about the problems that they have within their households? Have you read about their addiction to drugs, to alcohol, to immorality? Have you read about their suicides? Now, I think that you know, everybody has to have a reason for living. Everybody has to have something that makes them uh, go on from day to day, that gives them a reason even to exist. And I think for most people that are out in the world, what keeps them going is the hope that someday they are going to have these things. That perhaps if they work hard enough, or perhaps if they gamble enough that they're going to hit the jackpot, or if they buy enough lottery tickets, which is essentially uh, gambling, you know, you buy these lottery tickets and so forth, they're hoping that one day it's going to pay off, they're going to have all these things, and the hope that they might someday actually possess these things of the world is what keeps them going. But look at what happens to the people who actually get these things. I, mean, I had a personal friend who um, was basically like me growing up, but um, became suddenly uh, much wealthier because of family connections. And I'll tell you what, his life was miserable. He had virtually everything that he wanted. He, it was within with his reach. Uh, the car that, that maybe most you know, people of the world and perhaps some of us would dream about, a, you know, Porsche Turbo Carrera, which way back then cost, uh, I don't know, $60,000 for a used one. He bought it one week and got tired of it and sold it the next week. I can't imagine, but uh, I did see it happen. It, it does happen. And the reason is because those things do not satisfy. Now, what happens when you have all the things that you think are going to satisfy you and then you find out that those things really don't satisfy you. Well, that's when they begin drowning their senses with drugs and alcohol, trying to dull their senses, trying to find happiness some other way, or when they actually try to put an end to their lives because now they see there's really no reason to live. These things don't make me happy after all. I'm still miserable, so I'm gonna put an end to all of it. You know, the Bible tells us that the pleasures of sin are passing that they might be fun for a little while, but they don't last. That's the reason why Moses, uh, when he had a choice between uh, remaining the, the daughter of Pharaoh's son and being heir to the riches of Egypt, gave it all up so that he could suffer with the people of God in the wilderness as the, the, the deliverer or the Messiah, not, not the, you know, the real Messiah, not Jesus Christ, but the Messiah in those days because he realized that that path would lead him to the true riches and the true happiness, which comes in this life in knowing the Lord, but also after this life in heaven and in the new heavens and the new earth. True happiness only comes from the Lord. It comes by being in a relationship with him, in doing what he calls you to do, in seeking to become what he wants you to become. Again, those in the world look at God as a giant killjoy. He just doesn't want me to have any fun. He won't let me have what I want. He won't let me do what it is I want to do. But the reason why the Lord forbids certain things and commands other things is because he knows those things that he forbids will hurt you. Those things ultimately will destroy you. Again, look at the rich and famous. They're not happy. They're miserable. Their lives end in ruin. And yet the way that the Lord commands us to go, what about the people who walk on that path? What happens to them? Well, they are the ones who are safe. They are the ones who are actually happy with less of the world's things. They are the ones who are content. They are the ones who have joy and they have peace and they have happiness. They are satisfied because what they have is so much greater than what the world can give. They have a relationship with one who is infinitely glorious, one who is infinitely satisfying, and that is the God who created the universe with a word, and the one who created you. 
the only path to happiness is the path that leads to the cross, which is that instrument by which we die to ourselves in this world and we begin to live for God. Now again, when you consider that God is the one who commands you to do certain things, remember that really God is not the one who is profiting by your obedience. He doesn't need you to obey him. He doesn't need you to become like him. He doesn't need anything. We're going to look at that actually down the road a little bit in the evening service, the independence of God. He doesn't need you and me. He's perfectly happy without us. Otherwise, uh, he wouldn't be the infinitely blessed God. So why does God command us then to go down this path and to do certain things and to be like him? It's not so much for his benefit as it is for ours because we are the ones who actually profit. So don't expect God to give you the things that he knows are going to hurt you and destroy you, but instead expect that he will give to you the things that, that will ultimately make you happy. And of course, we need to ask the question, how can you know what those things are? All things are possible to him who believes. What things are possible? Not the things that God says will destroy you, but rather the things that he knows will be a blessing to you. Well, those are the things that he has promised in his word to give you. This sounds like, um, to me, a good reason to read the Bible, to find out what those things are. You know, this Bible that, um, well, we know was written by men, but it was inspired by God, and we believe it to be what Paul says it to be, God's word. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, we read the Bible because we know we should read the Bible. You read it because you know it's a means of grace. You know that God builds you up in the faith when you read the Bible. Uh, we read it because we want to learn more about God. We want to know him more intimately. And so when you read it, you do learn more about him. And these are both very good reasons to read your Bible. But you should also read the Bible to find out what God has promised. To know what it is that he's going to give you when you ask him. The things that you really need in order to be truly happy and satisfied. The way you can know that God is going to give you something is if he has promised in his word that he's going to give it to you. And so as we've already seen this morning, if you lack wisdom, I need to know what to do in this circumstance. How can I glorify God? How can I uh, get out of this particular difficulty? How can I help this person? If you, ask, if, if you lack wisdom, the Bible says, ask the Lord for it because he's given you a promise that he will give it to you. James 1.5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What if you don't have the strength you need to be able to deal with a particular situation? Well, the Bible says, wait on the Lord in prayer. Isaiah writes in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What if you're lacking uh, those things, or what if you don't have those things that you need just to survive in this world? And basically, you only need two things, food and covering. Well, then the Bible says you need to put God first in your life. You need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So you have a need, you look for a promise, you see that God has actually said he's going to meet that need. You see what the conditions are. Well, one condition might be prayer. Another condition might be seeking him first. But the ultimate condition really boils down to this one. 
and that is you must believe. Now, the Lord has to promise something first before you can expect that God's going to give it to you, but you have to believe what he says. Again, notice what Jesus says in verse 23 of our text. All things are possible to him who believes. Well, what is it that you have to believe in order to receive the promises of God? Well, I think essentially there are three things that you have to believe. First of all, you have to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Secondly, you need to believe that God is able to do what he has promised in his word. And then thirdly, you need to believe that he is willing. Now, first you have to believe that he really exists. Again, the author to the Hebrews says this in Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, if you're struggling with, with, the, um, uh, you know, with, with doubts over whether or not God exists, you really can't expect him to answer your prayers. I mean, it's like the unbeliever who's in the, the, the foxhole, as it were, during the, during the war, or maybe the one who's on the, uh, on the housetop, and he begins to slip, and he's falling off a three- or four-story house, and he cries out, if there's a God, please help me. Well, God's not bound to answer that kind of prayer, you know? Sometimes people do believe that God exists, and sometimes God actually saves them from those circumstances. But then once he does, they just walk away, and they're the same as they were. You do have to believe that God exists. If you don't have any faith, God says that he will not reward that lack of faith. He who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I think we could wrap up in this, too, the idea that if you are to receive anything from God, you must not only believe that he is, but you must also trust him. You have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved because God makes his promises only to believers and not to unbelievers. It doesn't mean that God doesn't answer the prayers of unbelievers. Sometimes he does because he is a very gracious God, but he has not bound himself to answer the prayer of an unbeliever. Now, another problem we can have in this regard is sometimes we can have weak faith. Maybe we do believe, but it's weak. Well, that faith needs to be strengthened. It's strengthened by stopping those things that make it weak. Sin will drain the strength out of your faith. Sin will quench the Spirit of God, will will uh, make it his work weak within you. And when that happens, you will find yourself unable to believe the way you need to believe, so you need to cut off your sins. And you, begin, you need to begin to use those means that God has given you to build your faith. And that is one of them. The main way is prayer. But reading the Word of God, believing what you read, and, of course, using all the other means that God has given as well, the supper of the Lord, the you know, communion, and certainly fellowship, and uh, listening to his word preached, because that is one way that God builds up our faith and gives us more of his Holy Spirit. But again, particularly pray. It's the one thing that Jesus pointed the disciples to. You needed to pray. You needed a stronger faith. You needed a greater power. You needed to pray. And if you had prayed, that demon would have come out. The need would have been met. So pray, and your faith will grow. So you need to believe that God is, and the stronger you believe, the more effective your prayers will be and the more the Lord will provide. But I said, secondly, you also need to believe that God is able to give what he has promised. Now, since that's the focus of the evening sermon, I'm not really going to spend any time on that except simply to encourage you to come this evening. I, I think it will help strengthen your faith in God's ability when we meditate on it and see in the Word of God exactly what God's capable of doing. And really, God can do whatever He wants to do. And I think it will also strengthen your love for Him. So you need, secondly, 
not to doubt, but rather to believe that God can actually do what he says in his word that he will do for you if you look to him in faith. But then finally, and I think this is the biggest problem that we have as Christians, you have to believe that he's willing to give you what he promises. Granted, God exists, I believe he exists, and I believe he's capable. He spoke the universe into existence with a word. He has power, but will he do this for me? Sometimes I think this is, again, where we fail. You don't believe that God is willing to do what he promises. Well, let me ask you the the question. Do you think he's willing? Do you think that God would make you a promise if he really had no intention of carrying that promise out? Do you think that God lies? Well, if God always tells the truth and God has made a promise, then how can you possibly doubt that God is going to do what he says he's going to do? You see, we have no reason to doubt that God is even willing because he wouldn't have made the promise if he didn't fully intend to carry it through. You just simply need to believe that he will do it because he has said that he will. Now again, the problem may be that God will do this for other people, but he won't do it for you. But again, you need to remember that if you have trusted Jesus and you still don't believe that he will do this for you, it all boils down to a lack of faith. You need to trust God. Trust him. When we talk about trusting Jesus Christ, I mean, what do we mean by that? We mean that we are putting our future into his hands, that we are entrusting our souls, our eternal souls that are going to go on forever in one of two states, either in blessedness or in in punishment, that we are trusting our lives to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to trust him. Now, if you're a Christian, that means that you have trusted Jesus. You must believe that he's at least trustworthy if you're going to place your whole well-being for eternity into his hands. Well, if you can do that, can't you trust that God is going to do everything else that he said? I mean, what is that compared to trusting your soul to him? God is trustworthy, and he will do what he has said he will do. But again, remember that this promise only applies to those who truly trust in him. If you have trusted the Lord, if you are one of his children, These promises, all of these promises actually apply to you. You do have to believe him. So one thing you you should do if, if you are having difficulty trusting the Lord, maybe you're having difficulty in the other area as well as as far as trusting Jesus. Maybe you aren't a Christian. So first of all, make your calling and election sure. Make sure that you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure you have turned to him in faith and are turning from your sins. If you aren't, then ask God for the grace to be able to do so. You need to trust the Lord. You need to believe. If you do, if you're able to do that by his grace, then you need to realize that you do have the grace to do everything else that you need. You have the faith that you need to trust his word. By the way, I should mention, I should mention this too. When you have a clear promise, you know when you pray these things. You can pray believing for the reasons I've already said. God exists. The fact that you're here proves that he exists. You didn't get here by accident. And as much as people might want to believe evolution, if you just consider for a moment what evolution is, an accidental creation of all this complexity that we see and everything you see in your, human, in your bodies, everything you see in creation, that's, that's crazy. It doesn't explain anything. Okay? We know that God exists. So if you... You know God exists. You also know that if he created all these things, he has the power to do whatever it is you're asking him to do. And you also know that if he's given you the promise in his word, that he is also willing to do those things. You have everything you need. But what if you can't find a promise in his word for a particular thing? You know, that you you can't pray then believing, or at least so it seems, 
if you don't have a particular promise, although God's promises are pretty expansive, but sometimes the particulars. I know God says he will do certain things, but will he do it in this circumstance? Will he do it for this person? Uh, that I may not know. And so then how do I pray in, a search, uh, in those circumstances believing? Well, there's only one way you can do that, and that is if God happens to give you a particular grace to believe strongly in that situation. Sometimes he does. Uh, you don't know why, except perhaps God is the one who is giving you that faith, but you know that if you pray this prayer, God is going to answer that prayer. Not for something contrary to his will, but something in a particular circumstance. You may not have, okay, a particular promise here that God's going to heal this particular individual from this, you know, this particular sickness that they have or get them out of this particular situation. That's why Jesus, you know, Jesus actually prayed in this way. Uh, although um, I think he, well, he knew the answer to it and the, the Father made it clear. But when he was looking at the cross in the garden, you know, prior to the suffering he was going to endure that evening and the next day when he would be crucified, our sins would be laid on him and he would suffer God's wrath on the cross. He prayed, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. And what he, was, what he meant by that was not, Lord, I don't, I don't want to go to the cross, so please get me off the hook. He was saying that, though, if there is another way that salvation can come, if you can save your people and repair your honor in some other way, then my enduring your wrath on the cross, then let that come. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And there was no other way. And Jesus went willingly to the cross. Now, we might say that is a great example of praying uh, a prayer of faith, but it is an example where a person didn't know precisely what the possibilities were. I mean, if Jesus knew, he, wouldn't have never, he would have never asked that question, right? I think we have to assume that. So he asks, and yet it wasn't possible. But there are other circumstances where you have the same situation. You don't know precisely what God's will is, and so you ask, if you are going to pray believing, then you can only do one of two things. I know that God is going to answer this prayer in the way that is best. That's one way. I believe he will do what's best. Or the other circumstance is that God gives to me a confidence that this is the right course, that this is what he's going to do, and I pray, and I know that the Lord's going to answer that prayer because it's consistent with his will. And because I believe that the Lord has shown me and has given me the faith that that is exactly what's going to happen. Now, that is somewhat subjective, and we need to be careful with that. But we do need to realize sometimes God does that. It's called the prayer of faith. But I want you to see in those circumstances where God has actually made a promise, you can pray and know that God is going to answer those prayers because God has promised that he would. But you, again, need to believe. You need to trust. God sees your heart, and he knows exactly where you're at. And he knows whether you believe what he says or not. And if you don't actually trust him, well, he may very well not answer that prayer. But if you do believe, you do trust that he is trustworthy. You do know he has the power. You know he is there, and he's going to do this. God says he will do it. You need to trust him that he will. And if you do, Jesus says all things are possible for you. Now, that's the one point that I want you to remember and to take away from this. All things are possible. Everything that God has promised, he will give to you. So believe that he will, and you will have these things. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us take all the things that we've heard and actually apply them, and particularly this last one. And again, I would just encourage any here this morning who haven't reached out in faith and trusted the Savior, God says that he will save you. If you come to Jesus in faith, believe that he is, believe that he's a Savior, the only Savior, and you will actually trust him to save you, he will save you. Let's spend a few moments in silent prayer.